So in this week, we're going to start talking about how computers do one thing after another. Uh, really, in the first two weeks, we've completely ignored the issue of time. Everything happened immediately. There were inputs, and immediately the outputs were some function of them. The inputs never changed. We didn't have any notion of change. We didn't have any notion of things happening one, one thing after another. Just was some kind of logical mapping from inputs to outputs. But that is, of course, not what really happens in real life. We need to be able to take care of time. We need to, be th to think about time because computers work during time. So what kind of thing do we need from time? Well, on the positive side, there are two issues that we want to do. The first thing is we want to uh, be able to use the same hardware to compute many things one time after another. If we know how to add two numbers, we don't want to just use a certain piece of hardware to just once add two numbers. We want to use the same piece of hardware to add numbers every time we have two numbers that we need to add. We just want to add them one after another. So we need to be able to reuse our hardware. For example, if we take some kind of loop in, a hard, in, a, in some kind of software program, that the loop calls for doing the same thing many times, we want to be able to use the same hardware to do that. Another important thing that we need time for is to actually remember things from the past. When we, we need to remember intermediate results, we need to remember where we are in a computation. For example, if we have a loop that adds 100 numbers to each other and gets a total sum, we of course will need to add the intermediate sums. Otherwise, there's no way for us to actually get build up the total sum. And th these are the two things that we really want to think about time for. And yet there's another thing that we really don't want to think about time for, but we need to basically get, you know, sweep it under the rug in a satisfactory manner. And that is the fact that computers work in some finite speed, and we need to be able to make sure that we don't ask the computer to perform computations faster than it can, or that at least we know how fast to, can our computer run. So let's see how, uh, what is the way we're going to deal with it. So really, in physics, in the physical world, time is a continuous arrow of time. Starts at time negative infinity, maybe, you know, maybe the Big Bang, and keeps that advancing in seconds, milliseconds, microseconds, picoseconds, maybe to some limit of quantum time, but maybe not. What we're going to do, what everyone does in computer science, we're going to actually convert this continuous physical time, which is very complicated to think about, into discrete time. We're going to have what's called a clock, which is some kind of oscillator going up and down at a certain fixed rate. And each cycle of the clock we're going to treat as one digital integer time unit. So once we have this clock, it will basically break up our physical continuous time into a sequence of time equals one, time equals two, times equals three, and so on. Within each time unit, we're going to deal as a time within each time unit as though it is one indivisible thing. Nothing changes within a time unit, within an integer time unit. So for example, if we have a NOT gate, for example, if we look at its input and its output, at every different time unit, it can have a different input. And at that time unit, it will compute the output from that input in an instantaneous manner as we think about it. Every time unit, the input could change, and then the output would follow. So if you look at the diagram we see here, we see that in time one, the input is one. The output is then, of course, zero, because that's what a NOT gate does. At time two, the input was was, uh, going, went down to zero. For example, it could be stay one. But if it went down to zero, immediately the output goes up to one, and so on. So this is the way we are thinking about it. And this is the way we build all our sequential logic in computers, one after another, in integer time steps. So at this point, now is the time to actually sweep under the rug the issue of delays. When you really look at a physical signal that's really uh, implemented somehow, maybe, probably, with some electrical signals, it doesn't change instantaneously in zero time between time, logical time one and logical time two, or between logical time zero and logical times one. Really, the electrical current builds slowly, and the voltage maybe, if that's how we represent the actual bits, it changes slowly. And then what we really see, if we look at the, at the actual analog signal inside our implementation of the gate, is going to be some kind of waveform like we see here in time unit one. It takes time for the input to reach its final stage. 
And then it will also take some time for the output to reach its final stage. Probably it will take more time than it takes for the input because there's an additional delay, the delay of the gate itself. The, the whole point of uh, this uh, logical way that we treat, we break time into digital, into integer units, is the fact that you don't want to think about these delays. As long as our clock cycle is not too fast, as long as we take, give ourselves enough time between consecutive time units, we can ignore everything that happened at the beginning of the cycle, all the gray area here. And as long as by the end of the gray area, all the signals reach their true and final and consistent state, we are all done. In fact, the way we choose the cycle of the clock is to make sure that all the hardware there really stabilizes and the implementations give you the logical operations by the end of the gray unit, and the clock needs to be just a little bit uh, wider than that. So really, in reality, there is going to be all these gray areas where voltages changes and the system basically tries to stabilize into the new logical uh, situations. And what happens at the end of the clock cycle is what we view as a real logical state of the system, and then, we can simply ignore these inconsistencies because now whatever happened before the gray area, we don't need to worry about it because we know it's gone by the end of the clock cycle. So that ends our, the way that we sweep under the rug the issue of delays and that really justifies the way that we can think about time in integer steps one after another. So now we've reached a situation that we have integer time units and we know that something can happen at every different time unit. Under this perspective, all the logic that we talked about in lectures one and two is, was combinatorial. The output at time t completely depended on the input at time t. There was no information moved from time t minus one to time, to time t. What we're talking about when we say sequential logic, what we mean is that the information at time t, the output at time t, depends on the input at time t minus one. We remember things from last period, and on, based on the previous input at the previous time step, we actually compute our output at the new time step. So if we look at the diagram of time units, one, two, three, four, and if the input is A, B, C, D, whatever input, it can be a single bit, it can be a multibus bit. In combinatorial logic, at each time unit point, A was converted to some function of A, so the output at time two was, the in, was a function of the input at time two. And each time unit, we could have a different input and different output. When we have sequential logic, the output at time t, it depends on the input at time t minus one, on what happened previously. In principle, we could also have it depend on what is happening now at time t itself, but it's probably best to actually, uh, to actually split the two types of computation we do the combinatorial logic which happens instantaneously within a time unit, and the sequential logic where we don't want to mix new information with old information usually, so we just think about that time at time t plus one depends on the, on the input as the previous time unit at time t. Once we have this point of view, we can do a really interesting point of view. We can actually have the input and the output be the same bits, the same buses, the same locations in our hardware. We, and we can now recall it as state. As long as now what the, our value at time t depends on the previous value at time t minus one, we can have these values live in the same wires in the circuit. So now we can have a single bit, for example, that holds a uh, called state, and if at time one it was some kind of uh, input a, at time two it will be some kind of function of a, f of a, at time three it will be some function f of f of a, basically f of the previous value that we have, and so on. This now lets us, for the first time, actually change state as we go along, along, never remembering and always building on all previous results. So this ends uh, the basic uh, abstract way we're thinking about time in, uh, in digital circuits, the fact that we actually break it into integer time steps and we look at what happens it sequentially, one time step after another, rather than in a continuous way. And what we're going to do in the next unit is actually de describe the chips that allow us to do this kind of manipulation.